Okay guys, we've got uh, two slides here on uh, one topic, but it's a big topic. Uh, Watergate. This is the uh, the most well-known of all presidential scandals. Uh, in fact, every scandal nowadays uh, seems to get a gate thrown at the end of it uh, because of Watergate. Um, now to understand uh, really why Watergate is such a big deal and why it happens at all, you... Uh, you have to understand something about Richard Nixon. And if you don't understand this, why Watergate happens doesn't make much sense. So let's start with talking about Nixon's background. Um, Nixon's not like most presidents. Um, he doesn't come from a lot of money. He's not rich. He doesn't attend fancy Ivy League colleges to get a law degree and all of that. Um, he's a Midwesterner. He goes to public uh, schools and public universities. Uh, and because of that, he never feels like he quite fits in um, with the wealthy uh, political uh, socialites. Uh, he never feels like he's one of them. And he never fully trusts them uh, because he thinks they don't trust him. Uh, so that sort of paranoia uh, is what's driving Richard Nixon um, in 1972, as he prepares for his re-election campaign. Now, if you'll recall, he wins in 68, thanks mainly due to the mess in Chicago uh, with the violence against the protesters and so forth. Uh, the Republicans will be the big beneficiary of that. And it is Nixon who will benefit most. Uh, he will win in 68, and he's going to run for re-election in 72. And even though he's popular, um, he's brought troops home from uh, Vietnam. There's just a few left by the time this happens. Um, I, even though he's well-liked, he's he always believes he's not liked enough. He's not popular enough, that people don't really like him. Um, so it's that paranoia that kind of drives Nixon in his re-election campaign in 1972. It is also that paranoia that allows him to create what he calls his enemies list. Nixon actually puts together a list of people that he believes are out to get him. Uh, his political enemies, anybody who disagrees with his policies, um, um, entertainers, Hollywood, uh, bigwigs, and so forth, anybody not on his side, Nixon decides he's going to get before they can get him. Even if they're not out to get him, it's this paranoia that's driving him. Okay. Now, on his list uh, is a man named Daniel Ellsberg, who has released something called the Pentagon Papers. Um, Ellsberg was an official at the Pentagon um, who released uh, a set of writings and papers to the New York Times um, which chronicled uh, America's screw-ups, missteps, mistakes, whatever you want to call them, in Vietnam. Uh, they are especially critical of the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Uh, they expose the whole Gulf of Tonkin incident, that the, uh, the USS Maddox never was attacked, that uh, we're looking for a reason to get involved in Vietnam and all of that. Uh, very critical of Kennedy and Nixon. It says absolutely nothing bad about, or sorry, critical of Kennedy and Johnson. It says absolutely nothing bad about Nixon. Um, but Nixon, once again, the paranoia creeps in, um, is determined that he's going to get Ellsberg. Um, and he's just about sick and tired of information being leaked from the Pentagon and the White House. So Nixon... Um, will create an organization, or he will have uh, his closest aides create an organization that comes to be known as the Plumbers. Okay? Now, the Plumbers are a group of five ex uh, or former CIA and FBI officials. And here you see their pictures down here at the bottom. Uh, and the fact that those are mugshots should tell you, uh, give you a hint as to what's coming. Um, the Plumbers are former FBI and CIA officials that Nixon has put together to stop information leaks in the White House and the Pentagon. 
Because if you have a leak, who do you call? You call a plumber. Okay? So that's where they get their name. Um, among other things, other than stopping the leaks, Nixon's going to have them take this one step further. Um, and he's going to have the plumbers break into Democratic National Headquarters, which are located in the Watergate complex. That's this series of buildings up here at the top of the page. Um, it's high-rent apartments, um, shopping uh, centers, and office buildings. And in the Watergate are the Democratic National Headquarters. Nixon wants to know what the Democrats are up to. He wants to know um, what their plans are, what their um, campaign strategy is. So he sends the plumbers into the Watergate to break into the Democratic headquarters and plant listening devices, bugs, on the telephones and in the offices so that the Republicans can keep up with what the Democrats are planning. Now, the plumbers are not going to do this simply out of the kindness of their heart or some sense of patriotism. Uh, the plumbers are going to expect to be paid and paid very well because, after all, they're breaking the law. So the, pump, the plumbers will be paid out of an organization known as CREEP, C-R-E-E-P. It stands for the Committee to Re-Elect the President. Okay? Committee, C, Re, R-E, Elect, E, the President, P, CREEP. Now, this is not a commentary on Nixon. We're not saying he's a creep. Every president running for re-election has a creep, a committee to re-elect the president. Okay? Uh, it's just unfortunate in this instance that that's what the acronym spells out. But anyway, um, campaign dollars donated to the Nixon re-election campaign here are going to be used to pay the plumbers. Now, that's a great plan, in theory, until the plumbers get caught. Okay? Uh, the night they break into Democratic headquarters, um, they need to be able to get back out of the building. So they leave sort of a trail behind themselves. They put tape over door latches so that the door won't lock behind them. And of all people, these former FBI and CIA agents, top spies in the organization, get caught by a nighttime security guard. Uh, security guard is making his rounds in the water gate, checking doors to make sure they're locked, and he comes upon one that's not locked. And he looks and he notices tape over the locking mechanism. So he goes down that hallway and he finds another door that has tape over the mechanism. And then another and another until eventually it leads him to the Democratic offices. He calls police, police show up, and they arrest the plumbers. Now, this should have just ended right there with a breaking and entering. However, it doesn't. Because um, the payment for the plumbers can be traced back to the White House. Okay? And questions start to, to get asked. Who exactly ordered this? Right? It might have died even there if it weren't for two young Washington Post reporters, who you see up here in the right-hand corner, okay, named Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, simply, simply known as Woodward and Bernstein. Two young reporters looking to make a name for themselves um, start following this story and digging deeper and deeper into it. Um, the question becomes, how high did this go? The plumbers have been tied to the White House, but now the question is, how high in the White House did knowledge of the break-in and then trying to cover it up go? Um, ultimately, the question that gets asked is, what did the president know and when did he know it? Now, Woodward and Bernstein keep running into roadblocks, and every time um, it seems the story is at a dead end, they get a tip from an inside source, a confidential source, known only to them. Um, they give their source the code name Deep Throat. 
um, after a popular porn film uh, in the early 70s, uh, star of that name, the film was called Deep Throat, starring Linda Lovelace. Um, so their source gets the nickname Deep Throat. And it is the most closely guarded secret in Washington, in the country. Everybody wants to know who their source is, and they refuse to name him. We go years and years and years and years and years and years without knowing who the source was. But the source kept giving them information to take them to the next step and the next one and the next one, higher and higher up the White House. We might have gone the rest of history without ever knowing who Deep Throat was, but in uh, 2005, the, uh, the identity of Deep Throat becomes public. It's this deathbed confession. A man is about to die, and he wants the world to know that he was Deep Throat. He was the source. His name was Mark Felt. He was the second highest placed official at the FBI. So if anybody would have had information on uh, what was going on and how high up it went, it would have been Mark Felt. Um, when they go to Woodward and Bernstein, who are still alive at this point in 2005, and ask them, this Felt guy says, he was your source, he was Deep Throat, can you confirm that? And they say, well, if he is willing to admit it himself, we are willing to confirm it. So it turns out uh, the number two man at the FBI, Mark Felt, was the one tipping off Woodward and Bernstein. So the story keeps going, thanks to them, um, and eventually it will lead all the way to the top of the White House. That'll get you to slide number two.